Hi guys, it's me Karen from Karen's Intuitive Jewelry. How are you all? I'm hanging in there. We're watching a couple other storms approaching again. So we're not expecting any hurricanes, but possibly a lot of rain, which we don't need. But anyway, I think the death toll in our county is up to 12 as of today. So kind of sad. Um, I'm good, though. Just had a bunch of yard debris and stuff. Anyway, I had a couple of um, subscribers ask me about pricing my jewelry and how I go about doing that. And honestly, it's very intimidating <laughs> and really complicated, um, at least in my opinion. And so right up front, I will say that I basically keep all of these things we're about to discuss in mind, but I basically price my pieces intuitively and based on the local market. Now, of course, with our, you know, horrific situation, there's probably not going to be much purchasing going on even through the holidays. So, yeah, I got to keep that in mind, too, and just be ready. Um, but the first thing I'd like to say is um, I recently saw in another a group, I think it was Matt's Crazy Art, maybe. Um, somebody brought that up, you know, how do you price and this and that and the other thing. And of course, the discussion ensued. But one gal on there brought up a wonderful, wonderful point. And she said, you know, the first thing you really need to figure out for yourself is where you fit on the spectrum of jewelry making meaning are you a full-time jeweler and you're totally 100 percent relying on the income from this uh job right if you are that's going to be way different than say somebody this is where i'm at right now it's kind of a side hustle for me it's just a little bit of extra income um, I am mindful of the formula that we'll discuss or a couple of different formulas that are standard, industry standard. So I'm a side hustle, extra income. Then there's like the crafter, which they just kind of want to recoup their expenses because they just love crafting, right? And they might sell some pieces here and there and they do a lot of craft shows and, you know, that kind of events where people don't expect to pay a lot of money. Um, then there's the hobbyist, which really gifts most of their pieces. They strictly do it for the love of it. They may occasionally make a sale here and there, but they don't worry about any of that. They, they that's, this won't even come into their, uh, you know, mindset. Um, so I'm just going to show you what, what typically I learned over the years. This is the, the industry standard. You take your actual costs of materials that you're using for a project. And I have some things we'll discuss, some examples. And you times that by three to get your material cost, your retail. Then you add your hourly rate and other incidentals, um, you know, such as your packaging or printing or advertising, that kind of stuff. And you'll see how important the category uh, situation was. So that was a great question she suggested that we all pick a category. Um, because some of this you won't you won't care about. You you're not going to be advertising. You're not going to be you know worrying about how pretty your your mailing packaging is and so forth. Um, so yeah, so that's how you typically get a retail cost: materials times three plus your hourly. And here was an example. So say uh, your cost of materials total added up 
is $10 times three would give you 30 and say it took you an hour to make that whatever. You'll come up with a $55 retail price, right? If you're doing wholesale, like if there's a shop, a local shop that wants to buy, I don't know, 50 of your pieces or whatever. It's kind of the same theory, except they recommend that you do your materials and, and drop it by either one and a half times or typically it's two times. Now I have seen other people say to get a retail, they only do materials times two. You know, that's something that you'll have to play with and it depends on what area you're in, what the market looks like. If, it, if you're in a rural town that there's not much going on, you know, I don't know how much you expect to sell anyway, but you know, it depends uh, per country, per region, time of year. There's so many variables. And for me, it got so confusing that that's why I say I price my things intuitively and based on the market. And I'm in three local shops and I kind of rotate my product, my inventory, it'll, my new pieces go to the first shop and I have my first price there. I'll take it to the second shop after, you know, six to eight weeks of being in that shop, take it to the second shop, usually leave the price the same there. But by the time I get to the third shop, I'm looking at dropping the price because now we're looking at three to, you know, three to six months that they've been out there and haven't sold. So you can hold out for the $55 forever. I'm not of that mindset because what good is that piece sitting in my inventory going to do if I am dead set on getting that $55? I'd rather move it so I can continue to make new stuff and improve my skills and maybe, you know, the, the economy will change or things will improve or whatever and, and maybe the market will get better. But I, I never bought into that. I'm sticking to that and I'm not selling it for less than that. If it's a reasonable offer even, I'll, you know, I'll take it because I'd rather move product. I make so much stuff, guys. And you should know that about me by now if you're, you know, a regular on my channel. So I'm gonna, um, oh, I was gonna say, I'd suggest performing your own price comparison, right? Until you really get comfortable with, with how, you, you know, how you want to do this. If you want to be real strict and follow it, then do so. If you want to kind of compare, the other good thing that they recommend is get out there and see what other people, I, I'd go to a bunch of craft shows, even though I don't do them, just to see, say what pieces similar to mine were selling for or in other shops and stuff and go on Etsy and, you know, just kind of try to stay in the same ballpark. So you're going to have to experiment with these things for sure, for sure. Okay, so we're going to start a little comparison of, say, making a stretch bracelet, right? So I don't make a lot of these, and usually if I do, they're for me or, you know, for a friend. Um, they're just super common, and, you know, I'm not going to compete with <laughs> that. Anyway... For a stretch bracelet, you're using like Stretch Magic and um, about, mm, I calculated something, I think it was, I used 21 beads approximately, goes around my wrist. So here's kind of what I calculated. So the cost of that strand of bead, and there are little programs you can get, apps and whatnot, you can set up on your computer or just on your iPhone that will, you can plug in all this information and it'll break it down for you and you can keep track of it. And when you get ready to price things that, you, you know, it's, boom, it's there. But you still have to input all this stuff, right? <laughs> keep that in mind. But we're going to say seven bucks 
for a strand of these carnelian faceted eight millimeter beads. I'm sure it'd be more than that now, but I just grabbed $7. There was 50 beads in the strand, so that's 14 cents per bead. Do you wanna count, really, how many beads you used? We're talking pennies. And the stretch cord. It's about six bucks for 32 feet. That's about 19 cents per foot. So you use about a foot. So again, you're, like that's less than a dollar, you know, or, well, here we go. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. So um, where was it? Okay, here's the average stretch. 21 beads, so it's about $3.19 for the cord. Takes me about 15 minutes. So there I do a $25 hourly rate. So it's about $9.50 for me to make that with those particular beads. Typically, I'd be happy to get 25 bucks for stretch bracelets, really. So that's pretty good. That's a pretty good markup. Now they, using this formula, recommend that you take that $9.44 and times it by three to get your retail material. And that's already more than what I would be happy getting, $28.32. And then add my hourly, they suggest about $35. I don't think I'd ever get that around here, honestly. So that's why I say intuitively, I marketed this. Now, have I seen people charging that? Yes, and more. How how they sell, I couldn't say. How long has that, you know, been in their inventory? Again, don't know. I'm not willing to hold on to it that long. Okay, so that's one example of making a stretch bracelet. Then the other example I used was, let's see. Oh, making, forget the beaded part, because this is gonna bump the price up. We're just talking about a wire wrap pendant, right? So here's the wire. This is Parawire, my favorite. Again, it's not expensive. And this actually was made with square wire, so that wouldn't, it's a little bit different in cost, but I'm just gonna use this. So where are we? Here we are. So pair of wire at the time, I think it was about $9 for 40 feet. So that ends up being, again, pennies, 23 cents a foot. It averages about three feet of wire to do one wire wrap. So that comes out to about uh, 70 cents, my cost. Come on. <laughs> Times three is 210. And then say the cabochon, this, this chevron amethyst, I'm gonna say I paid maybe five bucks, might have been more. Um, but I, I don't buy super expensive or a lot of super expensive uh, cabochons because I can't afford it. So I'm, I'm saying five bucks. So their calculations is times that by three. So that would be $15. And then the 634, the wire is 2130. And it would take me about an hour to do that wire wrap. So their suggestion is 4630. I typically charge my wire wrap pieces 40 to 45, sometimes 50 if it's, you know, um, a more expensive stone or I got real fancy, you know, on the wire wrapping and added more beads or whatever. But again, you know, you got to play with these things. There's no clear cut way. There's so many variables, you know. And then now I add this beaded necklace component to it. That's a whole nother ball game. I'm thinking this is going to jack this price up. I'm going to probably ask 65 to $70, which guarantee you is still way under this formula that they give you. But I'm interested in moving my product. 
not getting the top dollar for it, okay? So there's that example. Now when it comes to soldering, holy moly, this is a sterling silver turquoise piece, okay? So the turquoise cabochon is gonna be more. So I might have paid 10 bucks for that. So right away, they're saying 30. $30. Do you know anybody who's going to pay $30 for that stone? I wouldn't have. This is sterling silver. Sterling silver is at an almost all-time high. It's at a second all-time high. The last time it got higher than it is now was in the 80s, and it is expected to go as far up as triple digits. So it's third, about $32 an ounce right now. So this is about two inches long by one and a half inches wide. And it's just the sheet metal I'm talking about. So the sheet metal averages me 550 per inch, per inch. So my cost, when did I do that? Uh -oh, oh, here it is. So I used, I calculated it was, because it was two inches by one and a half. So about $16.50 my cost in just the sheet metal times three, right? It's $49.50, almost $50 in just this piece of sheet metal that it's on. Then the bezel wire, here's the calculations for that. The beaded wire, right, that's around it. There's all of that. I won't even talk about what I didn't include, which is all of my tools and supplies, my flux, the solder, the fuel for my torch, or my hourly rate, okay? So just in materials, based on this formulary, is almost $95, just in materials. Now, I mean, if I added my hourly, I, I, it probably took me th th at minimum three hours. So that's $75 onto that, plus all these incidentals. So I'd have to charge well over $200 for this to, to be in that in line with the recommended um, formularies, but this is the cost that I, that I put on that piece. And it didn't sell. And it's been through three shops, right? So follow me, it's not so cut and dry. It's not easy. There's a lot to figure out. And I just can't be bothered. I really can't. And if you're going to do it right, you've got all your little findings, right? So you got to figure this out, which means, okay, I paid $12 for this container. I'd have to take all these beads out and count every one of them and mark down the, you know, how many of the silver six millimeter, how many of the five, so on and so forth. Same with your jump ring, same with your clasp, same with your cords, same with your stretch, same with your wire. How about all the other materials you use, right? And what about the wear and tear on your tools, right? I mean, all this stuff you're supposed to calculate into the formulary. So for y'all, I would suggest experiment with this, with this formulary. Just give it a try and see, you know, take something simple and try it and see what it comes out to and, and look around, look on Etsy. I mean, Etsy, you can get ridiculous prices because they're coming from overseas. You can't even compete there. It's unreal. Like I could find a turquoise necklace, sterling silver, probably on Etsy for 50 bucks. What? It's because it's prefabbed or it's coming from India or 
you know, China or Pakistan or wherever, but give it a try yourself and see if it makes sense and see if it's like outrageously expensive if you think that's so. Now, when I first got started, let me tell you a little story. I didn't have a clue about any of this stuff. And I was just really, you know, doing it for my mental health. And I got approached by a metaphysical shop and she wanted to carry my stuff. And so I had to scramble to try and figure out what to even do. So I came up with, I don't know, and this was probably, well, I know when it was. It was July 2020. I'm like, mm, 10 bucks, 10 bucks a piece. Now, grant you, I wasn't near as proficient. You know, I was making real simple things and I was playing with clay and mostly beads. I was doing a lot of wire wrap stuff, but very basic stuff. So I was pretty much just putting my stuff in her, for her cost, even though she didn't pay me up front, for $10 an item. And she would add her price at one and a half times. So what I would be happy at getting $10 for, because I thought it would cover my costs, and based on this calculation, right, that we just did, I was pretty close. She was charging 20, 24 50 25 bucks for this and giving me $10. But I was happy. I was thrilled. I was thrilled with that. Because never in a million years did I think I'd even be selling my stuff. I started this for my mental health. So in the beginning, I was a hobbyist, right? I was giving stuff away and then friends and family started occasionally buying stuff. And then, you know, I started getting kind of pushed to do a little bit more by those friends and family. So that's when I decided, okay, I just want to recoup my expenses. And then I got the little side hustle. And so I do try to be mindful of prices. And of course, you know, if if this was set in sterling silver, it'd be a lot less than the turquoise because this was only $5. And the sheet metal would be, you know, it's much smaller. You know, everything would be less expensive. But, and it's a whole different skill set. Same with the soft soldering. Try and figure out how much actual solder you used on a piece. It's kind of, kind of hard, you know, and how long it took you and, you know, your flux and all that stuff. So I hope this helps a little bit. It probably just made you more confused, but it is confusing. But experiment with it and give it a shot and try your best. I try to keep my prices really low so that one, people can afford to buy things and that I can move them and keep creating more things. And it's worked really well for me. Y'all know, or maybe don't, I'm in three local shops. That's incredible to me, never in a million years. And so I'm very, very blessed that way. Am I making a ton of money? Heck no. I'm thrilled if I make $100 a month per shop. That usually doesn't happen. I haven't heard from any of them for September that they've even sold one thing. So, and now the hurricane went through. So, you know, you got to keep in mind all those variables, like I said, but it's a starting place. It's a starting place. And YouTube's a great resource in other areas. Um, you can just Google and find this information out there too, because that's where I started. So anyway, I hope you learned a little something. Give it a try. Let me know your thoughts. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. What first um, I realized when I was doing that first shop and, and giving her basically everything for 10 bucks, I started, you know, hearing from other artists about how me underpricing my work really was hurting them. Who it's hurting is the full-time jewelers and I understand that 
but your skill level <laughs> is way advanced than mine, and you've been at it a lot longer. And so for that, I apologize, but I'm, I'm not in the same category as you. So this was really helpful, but it made me feel really bad. And the other thing that they pointed out as their argument was that if you underprice your work too much, that the general population goes, $10 for that? It must be junk. It couldn't be real Amazonite, right? It couldn't be quality. And I understand that too. And I've tested that theory. And for me and in the area I'm in, it doesn't really hold water. You know, I just have been much more successful just going with my gut. And uh, like I say, adjusting prices as I go. So until next time, guys, the other request I had was how did I get into three shops and what process and how did I find them and how do I deal with them? And phew, that's a whole nother complicated thing that if y'all are interested, I'll be happy to share that with you. And what do you think of my Halloween nail polish? All I did was black nail polish and this copper sparkles. It's very orangey. It looks cool. So, yay. Okay, guys, until next time, thank you so much for your continued support. I appreciate it. Bye now.